This video is brought to you by viewers like you. Thanks for letting me do this for so long. First impressions are very important. That's why I'm starting this video by talking about first impressions instead of diving into the meat of the video because that's how I do things on this show. And if you've got a problem with that and have long clicked off the video by now, maybe I should have made a better first impression and launched this video off in a better way? Well, probably, but given how many video games these days screw up their launch and yet are able to turn things around, I can hold out hope. Seriously though, it's almost become like bungee jumping. How far can a game fall and yet still bounce back with no major repercussions? How much can you damage your reputation but slowly claw back favour with the general public? All these questions and more will be answered in the latest episode of Rabid Luigi Talks About Terrible Video Games for about 15 minutes. It might sound like I'm assembling a firing squad to come shoot at five barrels full of fish, but the way the video game industry is nowadays, a bad launch absolutely does not mean that the game can't turn it around later. The wider question is if a game should be allowed to redeem itself, but perhaps we just want games to be good sometimes. Personally, I quite like it when a game isn't fucking terrible on day one. Why would you pre-order a game anymore? Obviously a bad launch doesn't always have to carry forward to a game being bad for its entire lifetime. In fact, the turnaround stories are so heartwarming that they can often make up for the fair amount of shortcomings that a game can suffer from at launch. To a point, of course, I don't want to pretend that everything is forgiven if a game becomes more of a finished product years down the line, but that is pretty much what happened with No Man's Sky. I don't like to criticise this game much these days since its early past is well behind it and Hello Games have spent a good five years working really hard on filling No Man's Sky with content and pushing out as many free expansions as possible. It's probably the single most redeemed game out there, still active to this day, but sadly that just highlights how rocky its launch was. Back at a time when expectations were sky high and time was fast running out for No Man's Sky to deliver on all those promises. It absolutely did not. The wounds are far from fresh with No Man's Sky, and so any real criticism I have for the game is more objective and less emotionally weighted by my own experiences of how it wasn't quite the game that I had formed in my head, and in fact the game of No Man's Sky was so bare bones and so completely divorced from what it should have been and what it could have been by all the build up to it that you couldn't help but question why they were charging full price for a game that felt like it was still in early access. You know, not a problem with our expectations, but they just kept promising things. No Man's Sky is a wonderful cautionary tale of the importance of having a marketing specialist on your team. Someone who knows what they're doing and is able to outline a campaign that tempers expectations and can handle all those tricky interviews full of challenging questions that if answered incorrectly can give the public the wrong impression of what to expect from your game. Such was the case with Sean Murray, who is definitely a creative man of a talent for making some fine video games, but he's no publicist and can't really talk about his games with any kind of cohesion or without spilling these elaborate tales of what the game might be by the time it comes out. So while it may seem like Sean spent the months and years leading up to No Man's Sky's release date maliciously lying through his teeth, you can pin it more on his inability to talk about his own game without getting caught up inside his head and how he thinks it might look at launch. He's effectively the five-year-old going around telling everyone how his upcoming birthday party will have Batman and fireworks and unlimited pizza and his parents, the dev team, are looking on thinking, ah, uh, sure. He's just too excited and it spilled over into promising too much and it left No Man's Sky with a very disappointing launch. Nowadays it's pretty good though, so I guess Sean got his birthday party eventually. The unlimited pizza update was pretty rad. You'd imagine that there wouldn't be too many different ways that a game can screw up its launch, like No Man's Sky overpromised and underdelivered, and the way things like E3 are going with massive, huge trailers and epic presentations, it's so easy to set your expectations way too high and just fall underneath them. But remasters and remakes, like, surely that's easier. Surely you can't screw that up. 
Technically, yes, it is possible, since remakes and remasters have expectations behind them based on the original games, and if you fall short of those, people will be able to tell. There's been some dog shit remakes in the past that never really understood the appeal of what they were remaking, and I suppose if we're being accurate, a shitty remake that lets a lot of people down definitely had a bad launch. However, I'm looking at less bleak examples of remasters that really should have been a lot better than what we got, and when you start thinking like that, you start looking in the direction of the Master Chief collection of enhanced Halo games. This is such an easy choice for a remaster, since it put six Halo games on the Xbox One early on in its lifespan, to help incentivize any consumers who haven't quite made up their mind on if to buy the console yet. It's not quite a new Halo game exclusive for the Xbox One, but it is a good start, and you can build from there quite easily. Or you can fuck up the multiplayer and no one gives a shit anymore. Not to undervalue the quality of campaigns in Halo games, but most people with fond memories of these games, beyond a handful who only played the single player, will be able to tell stories of how they grew up on Halo 2's online multiplayer through an early version of Xbox Live with that weird looking headset and children calling you a vagina over the internet, and so you'd come to expect that a remaster would at least get this right. Graphically, who cares? These games worked well and after a while you'd notice a trend. I'm on the same disc, so you can go from one to another with minimal effort, but that falls apart very quickly when the matchmaking is terrible and the whole experience is riddled with bugs and glitches. Like, the campaigns work well and the graphical tweaking is nice, but it's never going to be what people look for in these games. It's like going to a fast food restaurant and the seats are really comfy, but the food tastes even more like shit than usual. And yeah, the seats feel nice, but that's not what I've spent my money on! Things are better now, and the Master Chief Collection is decent value for money, but in 2014, things were pretty goddamn dire. Kinda set the tone for what was to come with Halo, though. I'm not the biggest wrestling fan around. Nothing against the sport, it just doesn't appeal to me, but I'm bringing that up now because 2K have been releasing a WWE game annually since the start of the century, which puts it in the same bracket as EA with their FIFA franchise. Probably something that wrestling fans look forward to every year so they can control their favourite wrestlers and throw them around the ring while their terrifying original creation slides under the rope to dish out more punishment. For the right audience, these games are pretty goddamn beautiful when made correctly. Trouble is, they haven't been made correctly all that recently, in a trend that reminds me a lot of EA's FIFA, suffering from diminishing returns sprinkled with a dash of OH MY GOD WHAT HAPPENED WITH 2K20? I know EA don't give a shit about doing new stuff with FIFA, but it's never gotten this bad before. What the hell did you guys do? It's the usual shtick actually, just a horribly unfinished game. These yearly releases are fine if you can manage the development of the game throughout the year, but if things slip even slightly, then you're facing an uphill battle to get the game ready for that autumn release window. A battle that you'll almost certainly lose. WWE 2K20 is the first game in the series to be developed exclusively by Visual Concepts, who were around for previous games but were merely assisting Ukes. It may seem like inexperience that costs Visual Concepts, and that's why all the wrestlers are silly spaghetti monsters now, but these guys have been making games since the 90s, most of them sports games too. Whatever the reason, WWE 2K20 is glitchy on par with the glitchiest games ever released, and whereas previous games were kind of eh for missing features, the core gameplay of 2K20 is fundamentally broken. It's like a pre-alpha version of a functioning game that hasn't had time to be properly stress tested yet, and now there's a glitch every 5 seconds or so. It even had a bug that rendered the game virtually unplayable at the start of 2020, you know, the game designed to be playable for most of 2020. It's not a great look. Maybe 2K20 saw 2020 coming and decided to get out of there early. These games are so ahead of their time, it's amazing. So we've actually managed to have a fairly diverse lineup of reasons why a game fails at launch. I know, right? Can't say I saw that coming, but it speaks to the many reasons why someone might dislike a game and how this can negatively affect the wider perception your game has. Just because a game isn't glitchy doesn't mean that your target audience will agree with all the other decisions made in the development of a game, and they don't come more controversial and disagreeable than Star Wars Battlefront 2 on launch day. You can't say the writing wasn't on the wall though, since everyone's favourite spawn of Satan was at the helm and they were fairly transparent about the inclusions of paid loot boxes that would be available from day one heavily incentivizing the early bird pouring money into Battlefront 2 to gain access to all the best gear and all the most powerful heroes. 
Whoa, you're telling me that a game made by EA may have put financial gain ahead of overall quality and how fans feel about the game? This is all news to me. Microsoft buying Activision Blizzard recently raised a lot of concerns about what the games industry is going to look like in, say, 30 years' time, and it makes me wonder what's going to happen with EA. Like, is a company going to buy EA? Or are they so poisoned that it'd be just easier to let them stew under a bridge like some money-grabbing troll? Or maybe they're pioneers. If the past six months or so have taught me anything, it'll be that there's a surprisingly large number of people with crippling gambling addictions trying to incorporate their illness into more socially acceptable parts of life. So despite how brazen EA were with Battlefront 2's loot crates and how essential they were to experiencing the multiplayer without having to grind for dozens of hours for the best items, there were probably a fair amount of apologists who wouldn't be able to find anything wrong with this if they tried. These people are wrong and deserve their butt-ugly monkey drawings that definitely won't blow up in their faces or anything, but for everyone else, these loot boxes were so unsubtle and so necessary that it quickly soured what would have been an otherwise pretty great experience. I think it goes to show how well EA make these games that they've since downplayed the significance of loot boxes after all the backlash, and I do mean all of it, there was a fucking ton of it that involved lawsuits and news articles and reddit posts, oh there was so much. And Battlefront 2 is actually a fun game to play years later. You're making a multiplayer Star Wars game as a sequel to the successful first game you made that came out right in the middle of the sequel trilogy of films when people weren't completely burnt out on Star Wars. You didn't need to do this to turn Scrooge McDuck levels of profit. Hey, if NFTs end up in video games, do you reckon someone will put them in loot boxes? Or would that be too on the nose? Oh, for fuck's sake! Basically all of these games are very recent because it seems like we're staring down the barrel of an upward trend of developers releasing an unfinished game and patching the holes in the weeks and months that follow. It might lead to some angry fans and reviewers who aren't so happy that this big AAA title has been allowed to be released with so much missing, but if it still generates big pre-order figures and massive sales numbers then no one is gonna care. Well, I'm here to give a shit, because even after the dust has settled on Cyberpunk 2077, with CD Projekt Red slowly clawing back some trust in their broken product, it's absolutely incredible that this game came out in such a sorry state. These guys made The Witcher 3, which is one of the most spectacular open world games I've ever played, and so the idea of CD Projekt having the best part of 8 years to adapt a tabletop RPG into another vast open world adventure that can do battle with Grand Theft Auto is possible. They're sitting pretty after The Witcher 3 did so well and they get grant money from the Polish government, so surely they can turn the most expensively developed game to actually come out into a decent release? Well yeah, they should've, and if you bought Cyberpunk for PC or current gen consoles then you were probably wondering what all the fuss was about, but alas, Cyberpunk also got released for PS4 and Xbox One, and that didn't go so well. If this game was marketed as a true next gen experience that is being developed with the future in mind and for a generation of consoles one cycle away from the generation at launch when Cyberpunk was initially being conceptualised, then you might be able to dismiss the unplayable state of the PS4 and Xbox One ports as a foolhardy attempt to stretch a game onto hardware that simply can't run it. Like trying to run YouTube on a calculator, it's just not gonna go. However, Cyberpunk falls over as soon as you refer back to earlier marketing material that puts forward these older consoles as its eventual destination. More so made for PS4 and Xbox One, unlikely to play well on next-gen consoles, we're not so sure they haven't even come out yet. This is a big deal for pre-orders, because more people have the consoles that aren't always out of stock, and so it's very likely that a fair portion of those very impressive pre-order sales were from people being sold a promise that never came true. Things were so bad on launch day with Cyberpunk being so glitchy that Sony pulled the game from the PlayStation Store for 6 months and offered full refunds while CD Projekt Red got their shit together because they received so many complaints from unhappy players. I... as, as far as I know, that has never happened for any major game release. A launch so bad that the store owners stopped selling it. How did we get here from such a promising recent history? How do CD Projekt Red expect to have any kind of positive reputation after this? You can probably expect less pre-orders on the next one.
The story of Cyberpunk is a complicated one that also involves some bad time management and forcing staff through months if not years of grind, but it's important to remember it because it's very likely that CD Projekt Red in the future will turn Cyberpunk around and, you know, it'll be kind of respectable, but just know that on a wider scale it only gets worse from here. This is Rabbit Luigi and if you enjoyed this video make sure to like and subscribe for more in the future and if you want to watch one right now there's one here about the best games coming up this year hopefully. I also want to thank my top supporters on Patreon including Joe Creamer, Devin Hutt and Sarah Malion. Thank you for watching and look elsewhere for cyberpunkness and full frontal nudity.